Warning, the following video contains spoilers for Shin Megami Tensei 3 Nocturne and Shin Megami Tensei 4. These games are best experienced blind and I highly recommend playing them before viewing this video. Lastly, the opinions stated in this video are entirely my own. With that out of the way, please enjoy the video. My first video on YouTube was me gushing about a game I obsessed with to this day. Shin Megami Tensei 3 Nocturne is one of those games that ages like wine. As years pass, those rough edges once criticized become softer and more malleable until those issues eventually disappear. What's left is a piece of media that you hold close to your heart, which is constantly revisited in awe of overall quality and what was executed given the limited budget and time of release. However, as with everything, time moves on and companies either reboot or create sequels. This fate would be no different for Nocturne. While I love Nocturne and it has a special place in my heart, there are certainly some rough spots that could use some modernizing. If you watch my Nocturne video, which I highly recommend, you'll know that I discussed Nocturne being difficult to recommend. This is largely attributed to the random encounters, lack of objective list, overall difficulty, reliance on classic dungeons, the narrative being a slow burn, and the HD remaster's overall quality. I also said that SMT4 was a better place to start because the game was more in line with modern gaming standards. SMT4 resolves almost all of these problems, but introduces one fatal problem worse than anything Nocturne commits. It's trapped on a dead console with an inaccessible digital store. Nevertheless, SMT4, if you can get your hands on it, is a modern day classic and is possibly one of Atlas's best games released in their 38 years of business. SMT4 is the evolution from cult to a more contemporary classic. This game crushed Nocturne sales, was the best selling mainline SMT game at the time, introduced many fans to the mainline SMT series, and is commonly debated in the Mega 10 community as one of the best SMT games and is in contention for one of the best RPGs on the 3DS. SMT4 is a special game beloved by fans, critics, and is widely seen as one of the best games on a highly competitive platform. With all of that said, let's finally dive into Shin Megami Tensei 4, starting with its development. SMT4 entered development after Atlas released SMT Strange Journey. Let me know if you'd like me to cover this game as well because I'm a, you know, I'm a pretty big fan of it. Atlas planned to release a sequel to Nocturne sooner, but their hands were full during the mid to late 2000s. During this time, Atlas would develop the SMT Devil Children games, SMT2 for the Game Boy Advance, the Nocturne Maniacs version for the West, the Digital Devil Saga Duology, the Raido Kuzunoha games, the Hishino Persona games, Devil Survivor, Strange Journey, and more. Atlas's objective behind developing SMT4, and I'm assuming Strange Journey as well, for the DS, was for player convenience. I believe Atlas and the team wanted players to be able to play SMT games wherever they were and saw the 3DS as an excellent catalyst for this. Kazuyuki Yamai, SMT4's director, said the game began development on the DS with Strange Journey's engine until eventually migrating development to another engine allowing them to leverage the 3DS's new hardware. Supporting Kazuyuki Yamai was Eiji Ishida as the art director, Kazuma Kanako as the original scenario writer, and Masayuki Doi as the main character designer. Kazuyuki Yamai's earliest credit I found was with Mach and X as a stage planner. He was also a dungeon map planner on Persona 2 Eternal Punishment and was a scenario writer and planner on SMT3 Nocturne, until being promoted to director and scenario writer for the enhanced re-release of SMT3 Nocturne. He's also credited as a stage scenario writer on Strange Journey. A.G. Ishida was the designer on Nocturne and got promoted to chief designer and event scene director with Nocturne's enhanced re-release. Most importantly, A.G. was the director of Strange Journey. Masayuki Doi's earliest credit I could find was with character coloring and card graphics with Persona 1 and 2. He was also a concept artist on Nocturne and has helped as a character artist or designer with several other SMT related projects. And Cosmo Conico was Cosmo Conico. I mean, like, come on, we don't need to really introduce the guy. Lastly, Demon Designs and Musical Score were both group efforts. The Demon Designs were a collective effort between Masayuki Doi, Keita Amamiya, Yoshihiro Nishimura, and Kiyomi Aki. The score's lead composer was Reido Kazuka, supported by the legendary Kenichi Tsuchiya and Toshiko Konishi, which are both legends at Atlas with rich histories as well. So, the reason I spent all of this time going over the production team was to do two things. One, to credit all of the talented staff that worked on this incredible game. They did an outstanding job and have etched their names into this legendary franchise. And two, was to highlight how few of Nocturne's cast actually returned for this game, excluding Kazuma Kanako, Kenichi Tsuchiya, and Toshiko Konishi, the development team was comprised of entirely new leadership while remaining close to the series throughout their tenure at Atlas. New leadership can birth innovation in modernized antiquated mechanics, but also runs the risk of alienating longtime fans from the series, and I think Kazuyuki Yamai understood this. During his time as director on this project, he clearly had a vision for what SMT was and seemingly used his authority to ensure the game preserved its tone and dark atmosphere. From the articles in the wiki I've read, he wasn't stern and listened to the development staff during the production phase, 
but wanted to preserve SMT's tone established by Koji Okada and Kazuma Kaneko instead of turning the series into a more contemporary JRPG. I believe Kazuki Yamai sincerely understands what makes SMT so beloved and embraced it in SMT4, which is why I have so much respect for him and the team with this project. The last thing I'll add before moving on is how strange it is that the mainline Shin Megami Tensei games ended up on Nintendo platforms while Sony received the more contemporary Shin Megami Tensei games. I always thought it was funny how the family-friendly brand received the games about nihilism while Sony, known for tackling more mature narratives, somehow ended up with the Hashino Persona games. With the development and my own personal confusion out of the way, let's briefly touch on the graphics, presentation, and the 3DS's limitations. So let's be honest with ourselves for a second. This is a 3DS game. It's difficult to be critical of a handheld system released in 2010. With that said, SMT4 was quite ambitious for all it accomplished. The sprawling streets of Tokyo, the dungeons, paths to explore, and the fully fleshed out overworld are still impressive to this day. I believe Masayuki Doi did an excellent job with the main character designs as well. The way characters move, their facial expressions, and the way their sprites are panned during certain scenes gives the characters their own sense of identity. By identity, I'm specifically referring to how Jonathan, Walter, and Isabo have several sprites expressing their feelings on situations and how their character designs tell you about them. Navar, for example, is one of the samurais that has his arms crossed with a grin and a tree stump. Jonathan is standing up straight with a hand folded over his stomach and wears a straightened scarf. His arms look respectful and almost implies he's willing to help. Walter, conversely, is slightly hunched over, wears his samurai garb open, is the only character with spiky hair, and has the scarf pointed in another direction, and has a confident smirk on his face. Isabeau is quiet, smaller, and appears to be meeker than the rest. I don't say this because she's a woman, but you and her are the only characters that aren't confidently grinning. I know I could be reaching here, but their designs and body language outline who these characters are before even interacting with them. Masayuki Doi, Keita Amamiya, Yoshihiro Nishimura, and Kiyomi Aki did an excellent job with the demon sprites as well. The final aesthetic point I like to cover are the graphics. Fans who have played the game may realize that models and textures look a bit sharper. I have downloaded the HD texture mod, providing sprites with higher definition models, bringing the game more in line with modern graphical standards. Combine this mod with increasing the internal resolution and the game doesn't look too bad. This mod enhances the experiences without infringing on any copyrighted materials. Furthermore, this mod is for educational purposes and I will have a link to it in the video's description. The next areas I'd like to tackle are with the voice acting in the soundtrack. Listen, I'm one of those people who turn on Japanese voices and just forgets about it. SMT4 not having Japanese voice acting is tough because the voice acting is kind of all over the place. The Black Samurai, Tayama, Hope and most of the main cast is solid, but the rest of the cast can be pretty hit or miss. I'm fairly confident that the voice acting quality is the localization department's responsibility. Maybe they learned their lesson with SMT5 Vengeance, but that game released with Japanese voice acting, so I'll never know. Something that isn't hit or miss is this game's soundtrack. One of the recurring things I've heard in videos and read online is that SMT4 has one of the best soundtracks in the entire series. The soundtrack, largely created by Ryoto Kazuka, is largely inspired by 80s rock and electronic music. This results in a soundtrack that that helps build the atmosphere, delivers another perspective during pivotal moments, and has tracks that will stay with you long after beating the game. However, music, like the rest of this video, is purely subjective. I say this because I'm not that crazy about this game's soundtrack. Like, it's it's still good, don't get me wrong, but I definitely prefer Nocturne's soundtrack overall. Like I said though, the game soundtrack is good, but discussing and analyzing whether music is good or bad is challenging because it's so subjective. Most of the community loves the soundtrack, and that's all that really matters, honestly. I enjoy it as well, but I'm not as crazy about it as everyone else is. However, I am with the community when it comes to this game's story and gameplay. This video is already going to be on the long side, like I can just feel it, but um, yeah, uh, we're going to try to keep this story synopsis pretty short. So SMT4 opens up with Flynn drifting through the clouds, being told that his decisions will create a world. After waking up in a burning city, you stumble upon a golden figure who turns into Walter and says you're going to make a world together. After, you're teleported to a desert where another gold figure transforms into a character named Jonathan. Jonathan says the same thing as you're teleported to a coast with a girl begging for help before watching the intro. From there, you wake up outside the kingdom of Mikado with your friend Issachar. Excited you're awake, you both head into town for the gauntlet ritual. After finding your way to Aquila's statue, you're greeted by a large crowd watching the gauntlet ritual. Issachar, confident the gauntlet will choose him, tries on the gauntlet, and it doesn't work. The soldier summons you, 
put on the gauntlet, and the gauntlet powers on, turning you into a samurai. Hope, the head of the samurai, escorts you to your new quarters and suggests you get some rest for tomorrow's training. After waking up, Walter barges into your room because you're both casualties and says he'll meet you outside of Naruko for your first training session. For reference, the Eastern Kingdom of Mikado is divided into two groups, the luxurers and the casualties. The luxurers are essentially wealthy aristocrats, while the casualties are the working class farmers and peasants. This will be important later, so keep this top of mind. When you arrive in front of Naruku, you meet all the newly chosen samurai. You introduce yourself to them before Hope begins practical training. This area serves as the game's tutorial. It introduces you to the combat system, demon negotiation, leveling up, the app store, your personal assistant Burroughs, and the works. After completing the tutorial, you meet Jonathan and Walter on the roof where they discuss their contrasting upbringings. After having another dream of them, they appear in your quarters, saying the commander requests all samurai to meet at Kay's tavern. Not a lot really happens from here on in other than Navar getting kidnapped and meeting a mysterious girl in a demon's domain, so we're going to fast forward a little bit. A few days later, you wake up and decide to grab breakfast with Jonathan and Walter. The baker tells everyone about a book given to him by the black samurai called Literature. He described this book as an exploration of the divide between the casualties and the luxures. Finding his words strange, Jonathan covers everyone's breakfast as you head for Lake Mikado. At the lake, you meet Issachar, who hardly recognizes you in your samurai uniform before heading back to Kichi Georgi. From there, you, Jonathan, and Walter enjoy breakfast together and discuss how strange the baker was. When you finish breakfast and head to bed, Walter wakes you up saying he saw Isabel on the roof. After talking for a bit, everyone notices a fire in the horizon and meets other samurai in front of Aquila's statue. A samurai reports a fire in Kichi Georgi as the team leaves to investigate. When when the team arrives, a villager says demons appeared in town and attacked while other civilians escaped to the forest. Hope assigns the samurai to rescue the escaped civilians in the forest, and after rescuing all the villagers, you stumble across Issachar who's been reading books from the Black Samurai. He says luxures have been withholding information and technological development in order for them to retain control over the casualties. Issachar, embracing his new demonic power, attacks the team as he talks about his disgust with the status quo. Before striking him down, Issachar recalls the memory he had with Flynn about becoming samurai one day. He begs you to become a strong samurai and change the rotten world before dying. Shortly after striking him down, Hope updates everyone that they've located the Black Samurai and requests you to apprehend them. Going even deeper into the forest, you meet the Black Samurai who's revealed to be a woman. She tries soliciting books to everyone. Everyone says no, she calls you ignorant, and implores everyone to visit the underground. She summons a horde of demons and escapes as almost everyone passes out due to a charm spell. Hope deduces the Black Samurai has been turning humans into demons through spreading this literature. After returning to Makai, and having more dreams, you wake up to an emergency call from Hope, ordering everyone to meet in front of Aquila's statue. Hugo, one of the church's priests, says they believe the Black Samurai is in league with the Unclean Ones and expects her to be in the Unclean Ones country. Hugo motions a royal decree directly from King Ahaz, I'm not saying that name, to capture the Black Samurai. After picking up the quest at Kay's Tavern, the team heads into Naraku, fights demons, and stumbles across the door with a warning from Aquila. Entering the room, you're greeted with the Minotaur, which will almost certainly kill you on your first attempt. After defeating Feeding him, you progress deeper into Naruku, find a gun, activate a terminal which can teleport you places, and then the grand reveal happens with Tokyo being unveiled as the home of the unclean ones. So with that background finally established, let's shift gears and discuss exploring Tokyo and the overall gameplay. Tokyo is broken up into three sections, the streets of Tokyo, dungeons, demon domains, and the overworld. I I think that might be for but the streets of Tokyo consist of these empty abandoned streets with demons lurking around every corner. During your exploration, you will come across relics to sell to traders, side quests, key items, ladders to climb, gates to open, chests, and more as you navigate. And I personally love exploring these areas. While these levels aren't large enough to be considered open world, each area is densely packed with secrets, demon domains, corpses, occasional NPCs, and demons that will ambush you while you're working through your side quests. Speaking of side quests, you will encounter signs of life residing underground or in bunkers throughout Tokyo. Most major towns will have hunters associations functioning similarly to Kay's Tavern. Here you can speak to NPCs, take on side quests, restore your health, and check your ranking. In SMT4's lore, hunters are essentially demon bounty hunters that slay demons and do other odd jobs for money. They pick up quests to earn maka or other resources to take care of themselves. Players will be visiting these associations throughout the game to submit quests or solicit information about your surroundings. The information and stories you hear from hunters and civilians highlight Atlas's mastery in world building. Similar to Nocturne and other Megami Tensei titles, 
SMT4 has some of the best world building in a gaming medium. If you watch my Nocturne video, you'll know that I have a dedicated section to the dynamic world and SMT4 is no different here either. To keep this brief, most games have static NPCs that have the same dialogue throughout the game. What separates SMT4 and other Mega 10 games from the rest of the industry is that most of the NPCs have different dialogue based on decisions you make throughout the story or whenever major narrative events occur. Additionally, instead of seeing NPCs as a means to an end like most of the industry, Atlas views NPCs as an opportunity to highlight the reality of living in Tokyo, providing background information as to why people took shelter and voiced their opinions on competing ideologies attributing to this world feeling alive and lived in. Throughout the game, you will come across NPCs that are starving, discussing how becoming a demon hunter is the only available job to take, rumblings about this shady group called the Ashurikai, running out of birds to eat, how it's freezing in Tokyo since they have no sunlight, showing no remorse for fallen comrades, and how kids aren't worth kidnapping because their families can't afford their ransoms. All of this in addition to getting jumped by demons, robbed with everything you buy from the black market and scavenging resources off of corpse makes Tokyo feel lived in. Combine this with the mostly incredible side quests that flesh out the world and it's easy to understand why SMT4's Tokyo is so fondly remembered. And while the side quests, extra bosses, characters, and finding resources are nice, let's finally address the elephant in the room, which is of course the overworld. Keen listeners might have heard that I specifically said exploring Tokyo instead of exploration or exploring the world. I explicitly wrote exploring Tokyo because showing this may induce some form of PTSD to players. After making your descent from the scaffold into Tokyo, you're greeted with a banger in the overworld map. Putting my relationship with this map into words is kinda tough, honestly. I distinctly remember getting to Tokyo on my first playthrough and being confused. I might have been a dumb teenager, but I literally couldn't see where to go on my 2DS XL. The paths were small, the map barely helped, and I always got lost. I hate doing this, but I had to frequently look online if I wanted to progress my first playthrough. The map is confusing, and it can be a chore to navigate, even though there are NPCs which will clearly tell you where to go. This really could just be a me problem though. Without belaboring the point any further, I run hot and cold on this map. I don't hate the map anymore like I used to, but that's probably because I've learned to tolerate it after multiple playthroughs. The best way to put my relationship with it is that outside of SMT4's difficulty, it's one of those things I typically warn my friends about before recommending the game. I think most of us have been lost at some point in this game, so I don't think I'm saying anything too controversial here. But then again, I'm sure that there's someone out there that sees something in this overworld that I don't, and I'm genuinely curious to hear everyone's thoughts about it below. Just to reiterate though, I don't hate this map, but I think it speaks volumes that I have had to learn to tolerate it instead of finding something to love about it on future playthroughs. Something that I am mostly crazy about though is the rest of the gameplay and the core combat to an extent. One of the risks many annual franchises face is that they usually don't have time to listen and address feedback and or criticism. Unless the series has the luxury of multiple studios working on various titles at once, studios typically have a hard time refining previously underexplored ideas and innovating new ideas. This process prevents studios from actually improving their products and risks frustrating fans as it feels like their criticisms are always ignored. Fortunately, this isn't the case with SMT. SMT4 feels like the culmination of everything Atlas learned from 2003 to 2010. If Nocturne established the blueprint for modern Shin Megami Tensei games, then SMT4 will be remembered for mostly refining that blueprint. Refinement translates to quality of life changes in this scenario, and SMT4 has a lot of changes that makes the game feel much more modern. A few standout quality of life changes I'd like to call out are the ability to save anywhere. Special physical attacks now cost magic. The entire team receives experience after battles. The app system was introduced allowing players to tailor Flynn to their preferred playstyle. Demon skill inheritance allowing players to choose which skills were passed on to fuse demons, seeing what skills will morph into, additional side quests, a quest log, adding a screen that tracks buffs and debuffs, each armor and weapon have unique aesthetics and animations, Flint's death doesn't mean game over, and the game doesn't have Nocturne's weird 3D tank control-ish movement. So, not to make a statement of the obvious, but all of these changes make this game feel much more modern and easier to recommend over its predecessor. Many will also be happy to hear that SMT4 replaces random encounters with these pixelated enemies approaching you. And on the topic of encounters, I think it's time for us to visit SMT4's press turn combat. Something I'll always appreciate is when developers are experimental and try something new. While I initially wasn't a huge fan of SMT5's large open level design, my opinion has drastically shifted towards actually enjoying wandering around, fighting demons, stumbling across bosses, riding rails, and just exploring. I praised SMT4 for creating a denser world than Nocturne even though it's geographically smaller, and I think the story has a much stronger introduction, more traditional character development, and an engaging hook lending itself to speculation as you explore Tokyo searching for the Black Samurai. However, it's also important to provide feedback when certain mechanics don't land. 
So, let's talk about why SMT4's press turn combo system is a step back. In my Nocturne video, I had a deep dive into why I consider Atlas's press turn combat system to be in a tier above the rest of the turn-based systems I've encountered. For those who haven't seen the video, let's briefly touch upon why I hold the system in such high regard. When a battle begins, each member on the player's team is assigned a press turn icon. Icons are consumed based on the actions you select. However, striking an enemy's weakness causes the icon to glow, indicating that half of the turn has been used. Striking an enemy with an attack they nullify will result in the loss of two press turn icons. If an enemy absorbs an attack you strike them with, you will lose all of your turns. Landing a critical and passing your turn to another party member will consume half a turn. And the standout feature is that enemies and bosses follow the same rules, meaning it's an even playing field. Everything you can do to them, they can do back to you. Now, something that's important to remember with turn-based combat is that there's always a lot of baked-in RNG or randomness. Hit percentages, evasion likelihood, and overall chance is present almost everywhere in its design outside of using items or blocking. This was designed to add a variety of circumstances to combat through incentivizing players to build around stats other than just raw damage, encourage a diverse set of strategies, and creates a canvas for seemingly infinite synergy through transforming moves from useless to useful. Put simply, if Persona 5, my introduction to SMT, turned me into a fan of turn-based games, Nocturne made me fall in love with them. And with one inclusion in SMT 4, everything I loved was almost destroyed, so you know what I'm going to talk about, so let's get into Smirk. Smirk is a state that has a chance of triggering whenever someone lands a critical hit, strikes a weakness, or when an attack is absorbed or nullified. When granted Smirk, evasion is enhanced, critical hits are almost always guaranteed, attack accuracy dramatically increases, and defense is increased as well. So, in my opinion, the system is so fundamentally flawed that it gets its own timestamp here, and a few minutes in this already long analysis video. Let's run that smirk explanation back really quickly. Evasion is enhanced, critical hits are almost always guaranteed, attack accuracy dramatically increases, and defense is increased as well. Yes, smirk adds another layer of likelihood, percentage, or randomness to a turn-based combat system. Like, why? <laughs> <laughs> like why? I've thought about this for several days, trying to justify its existence, and I always land on why. To make matters worse, press turn combat already rewards players for striking weakness with additional turns. These additional turns open up a myriad of new options incentivizing players to exploit weaknesses, but I guess the team thought that reward wasn't enough? Like, I, I I don't know, I don't get it. Like, this doesn't make any sense the more I think about it. The next suite of issues catapulted to the forefront are with the passive abilities gained with Smirk. While in Smirk, a defense and evasion buff is granted in parallel with almost always guaranteed critical hits. Missing an attack forfeits two press turn icons and landing numerous stacked critical hits with an increased damage multiplier in conjunction with the chance of this happening twice transcends any sensible game design logic. But don't worry, it gets worse. One of the welcome changes in SMT4 is with your friends embarking on your adventure with you throughout Tokyo. And while this helps with development throughout the narrative, it can be a mess during fights. Similar to Smirk's likelihood of triggering in battle, which of your friends joins the fight is entirely random as well. This can be dire during fights if an ally strikes an enemy with something they nullify, absorb, or reflect. Your allies run the risk of causing enemies or bosses, yes you heard that right, bosses to enter Smirk. This feels awful because enemies and bosses have the chance of triggering Smirk due to actions entirely entirely outside of your control. Like, you can die by doing absolutely nothing wrong in this game. This could have been resolved entirely by adding which of your friends you'd like to join and adding a Persona 3 Fez-like tactic system where you can influence what you get. Instead, what does the game get? Another layer of RNG for no reason. A culmination of all the issues I raised are present with this jackass. The Minotaur is meant to function as this game's matador, a skill check meant to assess whether players can actually beat the game. While I presented several solutions to defeat Matador, I can only think of four ways to beat the Minotaur. He's one of the most infamous bosses in Megaten and took me a few additional hours of preparation to beat him. I wasn't losing because my strategy was bad. No, 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 no. I was losing to bad RNG awful teammates and I couldn't hit him. The Minotaur has an enormous health pool, a devastating AoE attack with a very high critical hit rate, can buff his next attack, debuff all your stats, and he can trigger Smirk which can cause you to die in one turn. But don't worry, it also gets worse. He also doesn't use any magic and you can't create a demon that nullifies physical hits, which eliminates most of the strategies I presented with the Matador fight. This is where I disagree with most of the community. I've read on forums and have commonly heard that this fight is on the same tier as Matador. Matador functions as a skill check and forces players to strategize one of the many approaches to beat him. The Minotaur, conversely, doesn't have the luxury of options to win. I agree this fight is legendary, but not for player skill. No, I believe this fight is infamous because it serves as the culmination of everything wrong with Smirk. Smirk is awful and I'm so happy that it got reworked in the sequel SMT4 Apocalypse. With my Smirk reservations out of the way, let's dive into the much smaller problems SMT4 has. 
I'm convinced this next issue is a bug, but the maka economy in this game is rough. I've played this game several times and I never have enough maka to afford much. And no, the valuables you pick up don't sell enough to cover the absurd black market prices in the beginning or the mid game. And it's a shame because there's a lot of weapons with unique animations and cool armor that I'll never use. The game would drastically improve if weapons and armor were cheaper and if you could accept multiple challenge quests at once. The prices are probably easier to fix, but accepting multiple challenge quests may have been a system limitation at the time. On the topic, of system limitations that may have also contributed to the overall shifts in level design. Nocturne finds you traversing the vortex world, towns, and dungeons. SMT4 finds you traversing Tokyo, Tokyo streets, and the occasional dungeon. The biggest shift in overall quality can be found with the dungeons in this game. In my Nocturne analysis video, I said that great dungeons follow a few criteria. They must have a unique aesthetic, atmosphere enhancing music, a special dungeon gimmick, logically placed save points, rewards player exploration, and has a deliberate purpose behind the design. While the dungeons in SMT4 have these, they lack the overall scope, complexity, and sense of journey or accomplishment found in Nocturne or Strange Journey. This shift in quality can be found upon revisiting Nocturne Shinjuku Medical Center. I praise this place for establishing the overall dungeon quality throughout the game. Shinjuku Medical Center introduces Nocturne's level design by teaching players how to fight, how to recruit demons, rewards player exploration with shortcuts, introduces side quests, and provides hidden items for players that explore. Naruku, conversely, has valuables to pick up, a key opening a door providing you access to the bottom floor, and some poison. And that's about it. Dungeons in SMC4 are more rudimentary and are a step back in overall quality, but I wouldn't call them bad either. Again, I'm not sure if this is due to hardware limitations with all the 3D models, but the dungeons are much less complex. However, they're still fun to go through and they serve their purpose. This is more of an observation than an issue that I have, admittedly, but I just noticed it after playing the game several times. Even though the dungeons are simple, I still had a fun time and wanted to highlight this before moving on. Anyways, with all of that finally established, let's revisit the story and dive into to the themes this game tackles. Before we get into it, I'd like to remind everyone that if you're enjoying the video, a subscription and a like would go a far way in helping the channel grow. If you really enjoy my content and would like to further support my creative endeavors here, please consider becoming a channel member where you'll receive early access to new videos, shout outs at the end of my videos, and access to my outlines, scripts, and other project tools I use to get these videos out. Thanks for your support and back to the video. All right, if you've seen any of my previous analysis videos, you'll know that I typically spend a lot of time discussing the entirety of a game's story. However, I'd like to mimic the approach I took in my Prey video and focus on the ramifications of a few key plot points with a deep dive into some of the themes discussed. If you still haven't played SMT4, I highly recommend it. This game is one of the landmark titles on the 3DS and is best experienced blind regardless of the minor issues that I brought up. Additionally, I will be discussing spoilers from Nocturne as well. With that preamble out of the way, let's revisit SMT4's incredible story. Coming from Nocturne, SMT4 immediately surprised me with its expert level pacing and incredible characters. Nocturne has a breakneck intro where you meet your friends, the vortex world is created, and you start looking for your friends before the pace shifts towards a more slow introspective burn. SMT4's story, by comparison, is much more contemporary. SMT4 gives you a proper introduction with your friends, a hometown that you came from explores Mikado's governance structure and divided population, introduces a core cast of characters, and alludes to an overall greater mystery with the Black Samurai. As you progress through Tokyo with your friends, you experience how their worlds you shift into their inevitable alignments. This method of storytelling explains how the world functions, makes the world feel more realistic, fleshes out characters through seeing them evolve, and makes things a bit more relatable. SMT4's cast have established lore and reasons for being who they are instead of Yo, bro, this vortex world's rough. Let me go find God. However, because of the shift towards a more traditional storytelling direction, this game doesn't have the subdued development Nocturne's cast perceives. Nocturne was okay with developing characters off screen and uses cutscenes to debrief players with what happened. SMT4's narrative allows the characters to naturally develop alongside you, which helps highlight the contrasting upbringings Jonathan and Walter have. Jonathan hails from the Luxury class, while Walter is from the Casualry class. Both of these characters have had unique experiences changing the way they perceive situations. This divide between them can be found from their earliest moments to their final moments before leaning into their inevitable alignments. Isabeau deserves some praise here as well, as she'll commonly voice her opinion after some major decisions the player makes and is constantly split down the middle with ethical choices. One of the earliest moments that stood out to me was with Kubiko at the Shinjuku political office. 
In your pursuit of the Black Samurai, the team finds themselves in the middle of a conflict between the Ashurikai and Kubiko. Kubiko says devouring others is part of nature and humans are no different with how they hurt and eliminate demons. He also reminisces about a time before Law and Order, where demons were free. After striking Kubiko down, Walter questions whether slaying Kubiko was the right choice. No one else says anything here, but this is one of the earliest moments where future alignments are foreshadowed. Another area I must applaud is how much development the competing factions of Tokyo receive. One of the earliest factions players will encounter is the Hunter Association. They are the rest of mankind who've rejected both of the other competing factions. They're essentially contractors or bounty hunters who pick up jobs or quests to keep food on their table. The game really hammers home how there aren't many jobs to choose, prompting many to become hunters to survive. The other factions competing for control over Tokyo are the Ashurikai and the Ring of Gaia. The Ashurikai for most of the game operates in the shadows. People and demons tell you about rumors and things they've heard, but outside of red pills, no one has any concrete information on them. However, after the Ashurikai captures one of your fellow samurai, Tayama, the head of the Ashurikai, requests an audience with you and Shibuya, and after fulfilling his demands, you formally meet Tayama who requests for you to kill Yuriko, the Black Samurai. He wants this because the Ring of Gaia are using all the electricity controlled by the Yamato Perpetual Reactor. Tayama would like to leverage this reactor to create his ideal utopia. In a quagmire now, because the Ashurikai are holding a samurai hostage, the team travels to Ginza to take care of Yuriko. After entering Ginza, passing the Ring of Gaia's exam, and answering a series of ethical questions, the team finally comes face to face with Yuriko. Yuriko, the leader of the Ring of Gaia, reveals demons are humans with suppressed desires, said the rules established in the Kingdom of Mikado was meant to control the population and wants to return the world to its natural order until Jonathan and Walter clash. Lilith, demon transform Yuriko, implores the team to discover what true evil is and advises you to investigate reverse deals. Lilith, unlike Tayama, is one of the major alignment representatives you can choose later on in the game. Because of this, she's much more of a traditional SMT character representing chaotic freedom found in other Mega Ten games. And while we've seen this dogma a lot in other Mega Ten games, I have to praise how well the Ring of Gaia thematically embodies their philosophy. The Ring of Gaia believes absolute strength is important above all else. Only the strong survived when demons appeared, and only the strong are entitled to a prosperous future. Kaga's death is a great example as to how the Ring of Gaia upholds these un compromising values. Kaga is introduced shortly after the team uses the G-Ray Talisman in their pursuit of the Black Samurai. When entering the demon domain with Kaga, she demonstrates the ability to fight demons. When coming face to face with Shi Wang Mu, your team can't damage her, the Ring of Gai members charge her, they're all eaten, Kaga attempts an assault, she gets beaten down, and says she's okay with being eaten because she's weak. Most people or characters in video games are scared of death. However, Kaga and the Ring of Gaia understood they were weak and embraced their deaths as a result. While I personally don't subscribe to these, you know, cult values, I can respect their tenacity and how dedicated these members are to their beliefs. When you arrive in Ginza, you can speak with NPCs who knew Kaga and don't show any pity as she was able to live her life with freedom. I'm not sure if other video essays or discussions online praised this faction's development, but I was blown away with how well the Chaos faction was written compared to its predecessor. The team did an exquisite job writing here. Anyways, let's get back to what Lilith meant by true evil. After sneaking into Reverse Hills, you come across demons, doctors, children, and other patients trapped to chairs. Players can probably piece this together on their own, but the game eventually tells you that reds, or the red pills you've been hearing throughout the game, are harvested neurotransmitters from human brains. Before moving on, I just want to highlight the horrifying atmosphere in Reverse Hills. The unsettling music, the use of imagery slowly unraveling what's happening is all very disturbing. Coming here is always uncomfortable and this area's atmosphere really, really stands out. Achieving this on a 3DS is unreal and again, Atlas deserves a lot of credit here. Anyways, shortly after learning of the Red Pill's origins, the team passes out and wakes up in Tayama's office where we start to get some answers. Tayama verifies everyone's suspicions and defends himself by telling everyone what life was like when the demons first appeared. The day the demons appeared in Tokyo, mankind was fighting. Demons were eating people, the Ring of Gaia was destroying things, and the infrastructure bolstering society eroded. Tayama and the Ring of Gaia use these nightmares to justify their respective actions. I think they know what they're doing is wrong, but Tayama's sadistic smiles says otherwise. He believes without the Reds, Demons would cause mankind to go extinct since everyone can't be strong like in the Ring of Gaia. He sees what he's doing as a necessary evil for mankind's survival. Tayama, in my opinion, is an excellent anti-hero figure held back by his body language and some questionable actions. Being the leader of an organization in the shadows, holding a samurai hostage until you murder the competing faction's leader, kidnapping kids and harvesting people in the name of protecting Tokyo, and then justifying your actions with, well, this is better than the alternative, while sadistically smiling probably won't sit right with most. 
He's an interesting character and ultimately a great anti-hero as his actions are directly responsible for mankind's survival. It's my understanding that this character is written to make us ponder whether the end justifies the means, but looking past those means can be challenging or at least morally gray. Shortly after this bomb is dropped on the player, the group is ordered to meet at Mikado's holy land, Shendu, where we meet another competing faction. When the player enters the cocoon, Sister Gabby, a member of the monastery giving you orders throughout the game, reveals herself to be one of the angels destined to carry out God's will. The angels tell you that they've cleansed mankind and have deemed those worth saving as the residents of Mikado. Additionally, they refer to everyone in Tokyo as filth and threatens to murder everyone who tries to migrate from Tokyo to Mikado. Lastly, they request that you strike down Lilith as their words threaten Mikado's order. Conflicted over their orders, Jonathan follows the angel's wishes and requests your support. Walter disagrees while supporting Lilith, while Isabeau disagrees in search of her own solution. Jonathan and the angels, our law representatives in this game, don't provide much of an alternative in my opinion. Their plan is to cause a genocide in the name of God to cleanse the world of the unclean ones and prevent citizens from migrating to Mikado. So here's the part where I insert my opinion on the alignments. I honestly don't see much value in this approach, like at all. Referring to the people as unclean and openly causing a genocide to protect the current order is absolutely absurd. Trust me, Lilith's approach is extreme and people will die, but a sense of order can be created through fear. While I don't subscribe to governing people through fear either, it's a much better approach than carrying out a mass genocide in the name of God. Anyways, let's wrap up the story so I can finalize my thoughts on the overall character development and dive into this game's alignment system. After choosing between Jonathan or Walter, the two of you proceed to the Yamato Perpetual Reactor. After flipping the button, you meet the white, which provides you an opportunity to see what the worlds of order and chaos look like. These worlds are actually pretty cool because you, Walter, and Jonathan influence events in the past impacting the modern day. After spending some time in both worlds, you eventually return to the Yamato Perpetual Reactor and are presented with your final decision of which world you want to create. Now on my first run, I got the Nihilus ending and destroyed everything because this world is bad. But on this run, I went with the neutral ending and oh boy, we will get to that in a second. Before we get there, let's revisit our alignment representatives. Jonathan is the easiest to pick on, so let's start with him. Jonathan's character is weird. He has an irrationally blind allegiance to God, the angels, and Mikado's order. His upbringing and educational background make him an excellent fit to be a samurai. However, he has a steadfast belief that everyone in Tokyo is filth and refuses to listen to other opinions throughout his adventures. His worldview, perspective, and every Everything about him are shaped by his luxury upbringing and his belief in Mikado is above all else. This prevents him from even engaging in differing opinions and prompts him to simply reject everything. There are plenty of people like this in real life, but this character, in my opinion, does an awful job of persuading me towards his belief. I believe that if Jonathan actually listened to the competing factions before siding with God, it would have done wonders for his overall character development. His character isn't badly developed per se, but he's just a bit one-dimensional at times. Now Walter, on the other hand, does not suffer from any of these problems. Walter has ideologically diverged from most of the team due to his casual upbringing. Through his adventures in Tokyo, he relates to the struggles of the unclean ones and saw a lot of himself in them. Kubiko, the demon at the Metropolitan Office, plants the idea that humans and demons are actually the same, prompting Walter to question his actions. This idea would eventually be presented again with Lilith and Ginza and be reinforced with Tenkai. Walter, who hinted at being dissatisfied with Mikado's order, related with Tenkai being ostracized because of his demise heritage. Walter draws a similar parallel between the casualty and luxury dichotomy to the humans and demons dichotomy and really just resonates with it. All of this occurs before aligning with Lilith's new order. Because of this great writing and relatable struggle, I wouldn't be surprised if most people actually sided with Walter on their first run. Listen, the entire world has different governance structures and I don't want to get political here, but being assigned luxury or casualty from birth due to factors outside of your control is complete bullshit. This classification dictates your living conditions, education, family, occupation, class, and more while entirely preventing vertical movement. Being born in a system like this with absolutely no autonomy would always lead me down the path of anarchy and freedom as well, and this train of thought perfectly highlights the problem with SMT force endings and alignments. Picking is too easy. So this is the part of the video where I'm probably going to lose a lot of people, but uh, remember this is a discussion piece and everything I'm about to say or that I have been saying is entirely subjective. I'm sure throughout this video people have already disagreed or some people have agreed. Maybe I opened up other people's horizons. That's enough of the preamble. So if you've seen any of my other videos, you'll know that I'm okay with having a hot take or being contrarian. So let's rip the bandaid off. Shin Megami Tensei 4's endings aren't that great. Now, 
Before we write something in the comments, just give me a second to explain myself. SMT4 pitches four endings, Law, Chaos, Nihilist, and Neutral. Law will cause a genocide, Chaos will cause a genocide, the Nihilist ending will cause a mass genocide, and I guarantee you won't get the neutral ending on your own. Sure, you can say I'm oversimplifying these endings, but they aren't that thought-provoking when compared to Nocturnes. The Law ending finds you destroying everyone in Tokyo because the Angel says they're dirty. The Chaos ending is the survival of the fittest approach, which literally justifies Tayama's red pill initiatives since everyone can't be strong, and the Nihilist approach just destroys everything because no one is worth saving. Like. Am I missing something here? Because I'm not having a hard time picking. By comparison, Nocturne actually forced me to seriously consider which underlying philosophy I wanted to recreate the world under. Hakawa's approach of mankind forfeiting their free will to support a virtuous leader sounds great until you realize that Hakawa is part of mankind, which is incapable of being truly virtuous. Asamu embraces solitude and implores everyone around to follow. The issue with this personal utopia is that mankind will inevitably stagnate as we can remove competing ideologies. Chiaki wants to create a world of essentials devoid of superfluous things. To her, essential means strong, and only those with strength should be valued. I don't think I need to revisit why pandemonium is a bad thing, so let's move on to Yuko. Yuko was tired of humans being miserable and helped cause the genocide in search of a better world. After seeing the vortex world and not being happy with the reasons discovered, she wants to give mankind another chance by restoring things back to normal. The player is also presented with the demon ending, where you can destroy all the other reasons, and the true demon ending, where you can help Lucifer in his battle with God. These endings had me seriously consider which world I wanted to create and the ramifications my choice would bring. Hakawa forced me to dive into my nihilistic tendencies before realizing a centralized entity of power being led by mankind wasn't a great idea. Asamu had me terrified of never disagreeing with anyone and how little things would change without collaboration. Chiaki's absurdity, I, I mean, come on, she's the chaos person. Yuko seemed like a great solution until realizing you're not solving for anything. The demon ending punishes you for not deciding, and the true demon ending finds you attempting to end the cycle of creation. When I first experienced these endings, I remember sitting there with my controller in my hand thinking, just wow. Tackling several philosophical discussions in depth and forcing me to choose was difficult, even though I usually just end of going with the neutral ending, no matter how painful it is. However, as much as I love SMT4, because, you know, I, I do love this game, right? I mean, I wouldn't be making this video without it. These endings haven't had the philosophical staying power or fueled the seemingly endless conversations I've had with my friends. They aren't bad by any means, but they lack Nocturne's depth, in my opinion. Like I said earlier, though, this is all subjective. I'm sure someone prefers SMT4's endings, and that's perfectly fine. Nevertheless, something I know that we can all agree on is the pain of getting the neutral ending because, oh boy, let's get into this. The alignment system in SMT4 is deeply flawed. In other Mega 10 games I've played, you make a few choices throughout the game before locking into the neutral ending. I might have been alone with this one, but I had to follow a strict guide to get the neutral ending. Players can make neutral decisions throughout the game and they might get lucky, but this presents the next problem. After making the correct choices, you must complete a handful of very specific side quests to progress the game. The game justifies this by saying you must gather the hope of mankind before championing the future, something like that. I don't have a problem with this. What I do have a problem with is that the game doesn't blatantly tell or hint at which specific quests need to be completed. Whether you speak to civilians throughout the game, go to Case Tavern, Hunter Associations, or wherever, you'll likely pick up a lot of quests. This may cause players to blindly complete all of the side quests because they think they have to, or will cause them to look up a guide telling them which quests need to be complete. This could have been resolved by simply adding a star or something to delineate whether a quest is story relevant or not. I enjoy the side quests like I said earlier, they're great for fleshing out the world and provide some additional context and have some great writing, but if you've been ignoring these side quests throughout the game and plan to get the neutral ending, hey dude. <laughs> <laughs> Good luck to you. This alone causes the game to drag towards the ending. Sure, the neutral ending is great and provides the most content, but first time players should really just play the game naturally and get whatever ending they get. I'm not the most religious person out there, but just know that if you're going for the neutral ending, I'm praying you see this screen after the Yamato Perpetual Reactor. All right, we've been here for a while, so let's wrap this up with a brief thematic discussion before wrapping up this video. While the game's endings were a bit lacking in my opinion, the game more than makes up with its thematically dense narrative. One of the ideas proposed by Lilith is how much Mikado actually mirrors Tokyo. As Mikado is divided by luxury and casualty, Tokyo is home to a power struggle between the Ashurikai and the Ring of Gaia. Sure, you can try to survive as a hunter, 
but many civilians will settle with one of the factions. Choosing between the two will provide exposure to different cultures and beliefs that will guide your decisions and influence your moral compass. However, difference breeds animosity which will inevitably result in tension. Although Tokyo citizens have the luxury of choice, this choice isn't present in Mikado. From birth, you're assigned to the Luxury or Casualty class. This classification will provide an identity and shape you into whichever class you're given before perpetuating your beliefs onto the broader society. SMT4 tells a story about how these diverging lifestyles and socializing ideals with others can fundamentally change people. Seeing Jonathan, Walter, and Isabeau, mostly Walter and Isabeau for being honest, internally struggle with their upbringings before coming to grips with the magnitude of Tokyo is quite powerful. This fundamental concept makes SMT4 feel like a thematic evolution of Nocturne. Nocturne develops its cast by plunging them into the vortex world and forcing them to make sense of their experiences. Through this solitude and introspection, everyone finds their reasons. Conversely, SMT4's cast are provided lore, a compelling world, and evolve as the world around them develops. Most of the cast are forced into unique situations, causing them to assess their worldview before agreeing or disagreeing with their experience. Jonathan values Mikado's order above all and is willing to do anything to uphold that. Walter alludes to his dissatisfaction and discovers meaning and freedom, and Isabeau sees Mikado and Tokyo as one country, striving to bring everyone together. This is a stark difference than everyone struggling on their own before finding God. It's an outstanding narrative that's both engaging and very nuanced. SMT4 story, regardless of my thoughts on the ending, is an outstanding accomplishment and potentially my favorite Megaten story I've personally experienced. The other philosophical question SMT4 proposes is, what's the point of all this anyways? Before choosing an ending, the white exposes players to both Blasted and Infernal Tokyo. Both versions of Tokyo show you two different realities, both of them highlighting the inevitable struggle mankind will endeavor. Blasted Tokyo shows the birth of the Eastern Kingdom of Mikado and why so many citizens of Mikado have faith in God, while Inferno Tokyo depicts a demon-ruled area where humanity is enslaved for creating reds. Experiencing both of these worlds highlights the gravity of our decisions. One of the worlds finds you unable to breathe outside, while the other world shows humans walking around on dog leashes. The unsettling experiences in these worlds may cause you to wonder if mankind is even worth saving if these are our two potential options. This game does an excellent job, actually just most of the series, does an excellent job at diving into nihilism because most of the endings, or these worlds that we see, don't look remotely promising for any of mankind. In my opinion, I think this game really wants us to collaborate and work with others to create a more sustainable future for both the citizens of Mikado and Tokyo. And when you realize this story is just an allegory of why we need to work together, it evolves into something truly beautiful. As I close the chapter on this long video, I think it's important to say that I love this game even though I have some issues with it. I consider this game to be the best entry point into the mainline SMT series. Just steer clear from the neutral ending and you'll have a great time like I did. With that said, it's easier to say play this game than actually playing this game. SMT4 is one of the many incredible games stuck on the Nintendo 3DS. The 3DS and the 3DS XL aren't exactly ergonomically friendly handhelds, the 3DS's prices are rising, the 3DS eShop is closed, and the price of SMT T4 is becoming more and more expensive as the days pass. Neither the game nor the hardware are accessible anymore. Atlas needs to give their 3DS SMT games the Etrian Odyssey Origins Collection treatment at a better price point. SMT4, A Strange Journey, SMT4 Apocalypse, Soul Hackers, Devil Survivor Duology, the Persona Q Duology, and other 3DS Megaten games have aged well and should be more accessible than just emulation. I don't think SMT4 needs a remake. The SMT series is too old for a game from 2013 to get a remake, in my opinion. Company resources are valuable, and remaking a game that's only 11 years old as of this recording would be stupid. Stupid. Yup. Couldn't imagine anybody else doing that. Before sitting down to produce this video essay, SMT4 was easily my favorite Mega 10 game that I played. I believed it was the best entry point because of the streamlined mechanics, an interesting app system was introduced encouraging replayability, has an incredible cast of characters, a fan favorite soundtrack, and a story that will have you thinking long after the credits roll. Nevertheless, because of this game's inaccessibility, rising 3DS prices, smirk, neutral ending requirements, simplistic dungeons, and less thought-provoking endings, I personally prefer Nocturne even though it's much harder to recommend. However, regardless of my own personal bias, SMT4 has a much more engaging story, overall setting, more content, and a fully realized cast of characters you will most likely enjoy more. Like everything in life, this all comes down to personal preference. Regardless if you agree or disagree, prefer SMT 1 or 2, SMT 4 is objectively a legendary game and arguably Atlas's crowning achievement on the 3DS. 
All right, now it's time for the best part when I finish editing the entire video and I just kind of hop on the mic with a couple of bullets. But uh, yeah, so here are all of my thoughts on SMT4. Hopefully uh, it's the video that you guys liked. I was actually a little nervous releasing this one just because I know that like SMT4, like SMT4 is one of those games that I feel like a lot of people in the community have a lot of love for and I love the game as well. But you know, obviously I have a preference between like, you know, three, four, and five, just like everybody else does, right? So that's uh, that's all good. But yeah, hopefully this video wasn't like anything controversial. And it's also kind of weird because I didn't really know how to write it because in one, like, I don't know, in some regards, I kind of want it to be like its own thing. But at the same time, uh, you know, I'm going from SMT three to four. So I don't know if there's like a sequence or like a rhythm. I don't know. I'm still figuring out how I want to handle like videos that I'm covering in sequences because this will happen. And this is an excellent segue into the next video that I'm going to be making, which is the Resident Evil 2 remake analysis. So yeah, uh, before we get off of this video though, a uh, ton of work, hopefully it came out well, hopefully everybody liked it. And you know, it was my most requested video for a while. So here's to uh, me giving everybody <laughs> what they want. So uh, a couple of questions. What did you personally think of SMT4? Uh, was SMT4 your introduction to the Mega 10 series? I feel like SMT4 was a lot of people's first, uh, like their first bouting with SMT. So. Hopefully it, uh, you know, hopefully it pleased and it sounded like it did, right? It sold incredibly well as we saw in the video and all that stuff. Also, which endings did you guys get? Did you end up like me where you were going for the neutral ending, but you just kind of ended up with the nihilist ending where you lost in Tokyo as well with the overworld map? Did you have a problem with Smirk? Uh, what drew you to this game over other 3DS games? Like how did you get into the series? Just, you know, looking forward to keeping up the conversation in the, uh, in the comments below and hopefully if you enjoyed uh as always please consider subscribing leaving a like on the video helps tremendously feel free to follow me on twitter and keep an eye on the community tab channel where i'll let you guys know when i'm streaming uh next videos that i'm working on and other stuff that i have so uh one last thing thank you so much for all the support over all these videos like again i'm a small content creator so any type of support helps so getting like almost a thousand views on all the videos, getting over 500 subs in a relatively short amount of time has been, uh, I mean, <laughs> it's honestly been crazy. So yeah, thank you so much for all the support. If you guys want any more SMT content for me, let me know, let me know your feedback on the video and uh, I'll check in with you guys next time.